Hey. Hey, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's another beautiful day in, in Blighty. So uh, sun was out today. We're happy about that. Excellent. 104th, uh, I'm sorry, it, she was 104 years old today. Olivia de Havilland passed away. I saw that. It's very sad, uh, but yet uh, living to 104, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty yeah. We feel pretty good. So we're about to get started on History Happy Hour, everybody. And we want to welcome our viewers, both on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for being part of our show. And both those platforms offer you the opportunity to comment and ask questions and take part in our discussion today, which we hope you'll do. And we're here talking history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern or what is it, 9 p.m.? 9 p.m. Yep. 3 p.m. in Chicago. I should, we should have the clocks over in the back row. I know, right. You know, uh, for, for History Happy I'm Hour. Way past my bedtime for this show. Uh, well, you know, and I'm sure as you get older, as we do more and more shows and your bedtime gets earlier and earlier, <laughs> that'll be harder and harder. So, uh, Chris, we are, we're building up some audience here, so I'm going to uh, get us started and hit the world famous... Drum roll, please. History Happy Hour open. <laughs> Okay, and the bar is open here at History Happy Hour. I, 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 I can't find the bell. I ran off during the open ah. to try to find the bell. You know, bing, bing, right. Oh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, um, today, Chris, is July 26th, which is Turnip Day. According to the old Missouri saying, on the 26th of July, sow your turnips wet or dry. Oh, yeah, there you go. And, uh, and that has a bearing on our topic today, believe it or not, which we'll reveal as we go forward. And our topic today is the 1948 uh, presidential election uh, that is probably best remembered for a very famous photograph of Harry Truman holding up an issue of the Chicago Tribune with some uh, fake news, 1948 style. And... Um, it's an incredible election for a number of reasons. One is that uh, instead of having two major candidates, uh, there were four candidates who were pretty major candidates in this election. And the other is that it was uh, probably the biggest upset in American political history. And then there's a bunch more reasons why it's interesting as well. So we're really excited to be talking about this today. And to join us on this topic, uh, we want to bring in and add to our stream author A.J. Baim, who has written a book called Dewey Defeats Truman, which is wrong, A.J., by the way. That didn't happen, just so you know. I know. I know. <laughs> bummer, bummer. I got it wrong in the book? Uh-oh. <laughs> call the editor. There's, that's, there's a problem there. Uh, and AJ has written a bunch of different books, uh, including another book on Truman called, I believe, The Accidental Presidency. Um, and he's a journalist, an author, and a historian. And AJ, welcome to History Happy Hour. There's, I'm so honored to be with you guys today. Happy, happy, happy hour. Thank you. <laughs> happy Turnip Day. Right. Happy Turnip Day. So AJ, well, let's just start out and say the 1948 election, what is it about this election that's so compelling and so interesting that you decided you had to write a book about it? Well, there's two things. One, one is it's it's the greatest upset in American election in, American electioneering history, arguably up till 2016, but maybe even beyond. So to me, uh, you know, it's just a story. It's basically Rocky meets politics circa 1948. And, um, uh, I started writing it three years ago with the idea that it would come out during the election cycle now because that would give me all kinds of things to talk about with people like you in front of a camera. But uh, two things happened along the way. One is that um, I found a whole bunch of stuff in my research that I didn't expect to find. And two is events in our world sort of conspired to make the story feel uh, extraordinary, almost uncomfortably, uncomfortably uh, relevant today. Uh, you know, so I, and I, I should say, I, I, I not only forgot the bell today, but I forgot to ask you, AJ, what cocktail you brought to join the show today. 
Well, I'm in California, so I have a weak gin and tonic because it's only one o'clock here. So, <laughs> a weak gin and tonic, but it is a gin and tonic. And I will add that it's my birthday this weekend. So there might have been some gin and tonics yesterday as well. Okay, well, fair birthday. enough. And Chris, what do you have? Uh, bourbon and branch water. Bourbon and branch water. And I'm just a little, you know, a wine guy today. So yeah, well. keeping it calm. And, uh, you know, AJ, you said that um, that there, there were many parallels to the point that it almost seemed uncomfortable. So you, that begs the question, such as? Such as? Well, I mean, parallels. so many things like, for example, did you know that uh, both political parties in 1948 were very concerned that the Russians were going to interfere in our, in our election here? Um, there was this uh, the Alger Hiss case. So people were arguing in Washington what the difference is between a conspiracy and what the, what, what a fact was. Uh, the FBI was on a major uh, on the trail of a major candidate with regard to a possible Russian conspiracy. Massive rise in white nationalism, violence against African Americans, and altercations with white police officers. All of this was happening. Uh, some some things that were happening in 1948, um, oddly enough, well, thankfully. Uh, don't feel so relevant today. And, and so much is that there were literally nuclear bombs going off during the early part of the election cycle as we were testing bigger and bigger weapons in, in, in the Pacific. So one of the, you know, one of the things, AJ, that, that kind of struck me as I was reading the book is you were talking about um, all kind of the angst in America and, and what people were on edge about and they were uncertain about. And you talked about some of them with, you know, Russian plots and the bomb and the threat of possible future war. I mean, I had the impression, and I think a lot of people do, that after World War II, we've won the war, and the Cold War is going to be around the corner soon, but we've got a period of a couple of years where everything's just great. <laughs> um, and so talk a little bit about what Americans were so uncertain about, because, you know, again, we think that they'd won the war and everything was just really hunky-dory. Well, when we were coming out of the war, for starters, we had to switch back to a peacetime economy. And there was no way for this to happen without everything going wrong. So there was massive inflation, spikes of unemployment, labor strikes, civil strife, violence in the streets, and everything was seen to be going wrong for Harry Truman. Now, um, that's sort of the reason why we talk about the fact that Nobody believed he could win. But there were other things going on, like during the election cycle, the Berlin airlift was going on. So we're literally nose to nose with the Soviets on the brink of World War II. And so people were really nervous. It was the first election in the atomic age, the first election to play out on the television machine, which today is interesting because it's sort of a parallel to what we have in social media, a new kind of media that was right. changing the way campaigns happened. Um, but I think really the threat of war really freaked people out and also high prices. That was the issue that really faced all Americans, you know, sort of in their face in their day to day lives. And nobody could really agree on what to do about it. And so, yeah, people were angry. People were afraid. And it really became this thing like Democrats against Republicans in this, you know, a high fever pitch battle, very much like what it feels like today. One of the things that's interesting, uh, which we alluded to, is that um, there were, in addition to the two major party candidates, there were two third party candidates, I guess a third and fourth party candidate, who were important candidates. I mean, uh, one of them won a substantial number of electoral votes. The other one, uh, you know, won more than a, a million uh, votes in the popular vote. Can you tell us about those third party candidates and kind of the role that they played in this election? Sure. So, on Another reason why nobody believed Harry Truman could win is uh, going into the election cycle, Truman really decided that he was going to go after the African-American vote like no other president ever had, like no other candidate ever had. Uh, he desegregated the military. Um, he was the first president to speak to the uh, NAACP, the first president to campaign in the spiritual home of black America in Harlem. And this did not sit well with a lot of people. So Strom Thurmond, well, let, let me let me set this scene for you. It's, it's such an exciting scene. The Democratic National Convention in 1948, there's this explosion in the middle of the thing. And all of these Southern Democrats, the solid South, the so-called solid South, who were so devoted to the Democratic Party for so many years over one issue alone, and that's race, um, they, they stood up and said, screw it. We've been with the Democratic Party for generations. We're out of here. And they, they literally staged this huge thing in the middle of the convention is pushing and shoving. Rebel yells, 
Confederate flags waving, and they walk out and they launch their own party, the Dixiecrats. And so uh, Strom Thurmond takes over this party. He becomes the face of it. And he goes out on a campaign. There's all of this stuff going on. Uh, how do we feel about Israel? How do we feel about atomic bombs? How do we feel about inflation? Strom Thurmond goes out and campaigns on one issue, white supremacy in the South. The federal government, he says, is not allowed to tell us what to do. We have white supremacy in the South, and that's the way it's going to be. And he wins four states. Now, the other one is Henry Wallace. And Henry Wallace, a lot of people watching probably know, was a vice president under FDR who gets booted off the ticket in 1944 to make way for Harry Truman. So Wallace really doesn't like Truman. <laughs> And uh, he has this idea going into the 48 election that this new Cold War that's just been coined, the term Cold War just been coined. And a lot of people believe that we're going to go to war with Soviets. Wallace has this idea that this whole Cold War, it's not the Soviets' fault. It's Harry Truman's fault. And Wallace goes campaigning as the peace candidate. He launches the Progressive Party again, um, leaving the Democrats. And uh, his, his issue is uh, he thinks that he is the face of peace. He's going to save the world from World War III, and he's the indispensable man. He ends up winning no electoral votes, but he's a fascinating character and really sheds light on uh, his story and what was going on at the time. When you, when you were reading about Wallace, did you picture him with, a, with like, tinfoil on his head? And... <laughs> you know, let me answer no, back. This is so kind of – Right? He's a sort of a religious, mystic, spiritual, in touch, new age kind of guy. That's exactly right. And I, I'll tell you, th listen, th three things happen, as you guys both know, three things happen when you write a book. You do a whole lot of research and you collect a whole lot of material. That's a lot of fun. Then you have to organize all your material, which is like if you're painting a room, that's when you have to tape off all the walls. It's a, it takes a ton of time and it's incredibly boring. But when you go to sit down and everything's organized, it's really fun to write about if the characters you're writing about are interesting. And these people, Wallace, he wins nothing, but he's fascinating. He's a fascinating character, this weird mystic who uh, the, the further you dig into his character, the more interesting he gets. Yeah. And uh, I want to have a character in the book, by the way. <laughs> I... Well, can, can I tell a Wallace story since you're right there? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah please. So Henry Wallace. People have to imagine what it was like in 1948, very segregated in the South. And white America was very threatened by uh, by African-Americans after World War II because they had served in the war and they come out of the war, organized the NAACP. Uh, and they're, they're like, we're, we're going to we we deserve to vote all of these rights. We want rights. We fought in the war. We want rights. And so white America down there has been in power for a long time. They're very upset and very agitated. So Henry Wallace comes up with this idea. He's going to go campaigning through these southern states, and he tells people ahead of time, I'm not going to stay in any hotel where African-Americans and white people can't stay. I'm not going to speak in any hall where African-Americans and white Americans can't sit next to each other shoulder to shoulder. So by the time he gets down there, people are furious. So he gets down, he holds these rallies, there's violence, stabbings, and he would stand up at the lectern and literally get pelted with ice cream cones and eggs. And he would stand there looking out at these furious crowds saying, I would like some evidence that I'm in the United States of America. Yeah. Wow. Um, and he, um, and, 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 and in some ways, this, this um, in some ways, the, the 1948 campaign kind of shines a wind, uh, a light on uh, uh, racism, segregation in America. I mean, everybody knows this is going on. Uh, and yet uh, it becomes very vivid because of Wallace's experiences, which are reported because he's a presidential candidate being treated like this, uh, sometimes unable to go into a hall because mobs prevent him from getting into a hall. And, uh, and then you also, at the same time, you have Strom Thurmond uh, uh, out there campaigning uh, and using not very coded language. I mean, being pretty darn clear that what he's talking about is, in fact, white supremacy and and we need to stay on top and they need to not be on top well that's right but what what thurman would his famous speech is we will not allow negroes was the term he used into our homes into our swimming pools into our churches into our libraries into our schools there was no hiding what he was doing two things on that front though i think it i, I try to be really careful in the book to make sure that readers understand where he was coming from 
uh, and the fact that his constituents were really supported this. Um, this was he was sort of um, because of his family story uh, was uniquely positioned to to send this message, and a lot of people wanted to hear it. There's a reason why he won four states. A lot of voters agreed with it. Well, one of the one of the things I was uh, found really fascinating, AJ, was you're talking about the, um, the divisions within the Republican Party. So, you know, now we're going through an election process and, and there's been all these things written about, you know, the different factions of the Democratic Party and can they come together and what does that mean and what does the party look like going forward, et cetera, et cetera. But this reading the book, it seemed like the same sort of things as things are happening with the Republican Party. And could you talk a little bit about the different factions of the Republican Party and where their disagreements are or disconnects are. Absolutely. So it's 1948. It's the first presidential election after the war, first in the atomic age, the first in the television age. And uh, I think everybody at the time really understood that this was sort of like a drawing, a line that was being drawn between the past and the future. And it, these coming out of the war, both polit major political parties really had to redefine who they were and what they stood for. Now, um, in the in the Republican Party, there was this um, identity crisis. Um, the 80th Congress at the time hated Truman, and it was controlled. It was controlled both in the House and the Senate by Republicans, and uh, really by the conservative faction on Capitol Hill, led by Robert Taft, whose biography is you can probably see right behind me, and his personal papers. But again, fascinating character. He represented the conservative side. He wanted small government, leave the spending, leave the legal issues to the states. Um, but Dewey led the other side of the Republican Party, which was the, the liberal um, part of the Republican Party. He was um, a huge fan of Teddy Roosevelt. So he believed in Teddy Roosevelt's vision of the Republican Party. That's how he was raised. In fact, he used to be called Ted because his... his uh, his initials are Thomas E. Dewey, T-E-D. So his dad, who was a huge Republican, called him Ted growing up because he was supposed to, you know, sort of, because they were such TDR fan. Right. Uh, um, so that's De Dewey's side. And there's this pitch battle and Dewey wins. And so he ends up leading the Republican Party out of uh, World War II into the future. Um, the only problem was his politics and the plank that they endorsed at the convention in Philadelphia in 1948 was really at odds with the powerful Republicans that were in control of Congress. So that was your identity crisis. And one thing I can add is uh, people have written about the 1948 election quite a bit in the past. And one of the things that is lacking in the narrative of all the books written before was the amount of, it, because Truman is the main character and he wins. And so everybody writes about him. And I didn't think there had been enough written about what the Republican party was experiencing at the time. Yeah. Well, and I, I will say as a, as a comment on your book, I think that's the great strength of your book, because obviously there have been other books written. I don't want to break this to you, but other books written about the 48 campaign. But the stuff on Dewey, the stuff on Wallace, the stuff on um, on Thurman, and the strength is, is in bringing that up. Maybe it's not exactly equal with Truman, because Truman is still the, a, a fabulous character, but uh, uh, it really uh, puts a, a, you know, reveals a lot about that. And I, I, I definitely uh, compliment you on that. But you've raised a point that, that uh, um, uh, in some ways, Truman was, uh, the, the Republican Party was split and Truman is running uh, against the 80th Congress. Um, and there's a great scene that takes place um, in the Democratic Convention. You described one scene already in the Democratic Convention. But uh, Truman is coming to make his acceptance speech and he doesn't go on. Uh, well, television's already turned off. This is the first year of televising the conventions. They've turned the cameras off. Uh, he doesn't get up to the podium until 1.45 in the morning. Everybody's kind of listless. It's super hot. They all think he's going to lose anyway. And then there's this electrifying moment. So I'd like to play the video of this electrifying moment and then have you tell us why it is such a pivotal moment in the campaign. My duty as president requires that I use every means within my power to get the laws the people need on matters of such importance and urgency. I am therefore calling this Congress back into session on the 26th of July.
on the 26th day of July, which out in Missouri we call Turnip Day, I'm going to call that Congress back and I'm going to ask them to pass laws halting rising prices and to meet the housing prices, which they say they're for in their platform. At the same time, I shall ask them to act upon other vitally needed measures such as aid to education, which they say they're for, a national health program, civil rights legislation, which they say they're for, an increase in the minimum wage, which I doubt very much they're for. So why is this such a, a big moment? All right, let me take viewers back. Um, one of the most vivid scenes to me uh, is a couple of days before this happens, Truman is sitting uh, in his office in his pajamas. His wife and daughter are back home in Independence, Missouri, and he's watching this television machine. Uh, and he, he's sitting there and he's, he's literally holding his hand like this and he's, he's very depressed. And somebody comes to visit him and he says, why do they hate me so? I'm fighting for them and they just don't believe in me. And it's very moving when you think about what it was like, you know, to put yourself in his position. But he has this brilliant idea. And there's a memorandum in the Truman Library that I found and is a very well-known memorandum, but nobody's really um, ever agreed on who wrote it. And it's in the files of Judge Sam Rosenman. A lot of people might know who he was. He was a speechwriter under FDR. And it's this memorandum of like, here's this idea, let's call Congress back for this emergency session. And the idea is this, Dewey represents the, the liberal Republicans. Uh, the uh, 80th Congress is on the conservative side. So on the Republican National Convention, they have this plank where they say, we wanna, we support all of these issues, which in fact, Truman also supported. So in, in, in a number of instances, Dewey and Truman actually agreed on what needed to be done. And so it's in the plan, it's in the Republican plank. So Truman comes out and he says, I'm calling Congress back into an emergency session, which in peacetime hadn't been done in decades. And he said, well, your plank, your Republican plank says you believe in health care reform uh, and civil rights and all of these other things that Truman agreed with and said, OK, make it happen. But the conservative uh, 80th Congress did not agree. So here he, he could just drive a stake right into the heart of the Republican Party by exposing this identity crisis. And so that's what he does. And it goes over huge. Now, a couple, two fascinating things. Everybody who was powerful in that room either kept a diary or later did an oral history. So you have, you can, I could recreate in that moment in the book through all of these different points of view of literally the people are sitting on the stage at the time. And the way they described that moment um, really sort of brings it to, to life on the page because, you know, you, when you're reading the book, you can't see this footage. But um, I'm hoping that I could catch the, ca capture sort of the excitement of the moment. Well, one of the things you bring out in your book, AJ, is that Truman seems he's he's, he's actually he never doubts himself. Uh, it seems like he's he's you know he's always like I'm going to win. Is is that? But did he really believe that? Is that something he had to kind of convince himself of? But I mean, that's given the odds that you set out when he, when this starts. Obviously, there's he's not going to win, right? And he can't raise money. He can't get his train out of the station, literally, because he can't get donations. Uh, but he has this conviction that he's going to do it. And is that, you know, does he really believe that? Or does he convince himself of that? Or Here, Here's the thing. No one but Harry Truman will ever know the answer to that question. What we do know is that everybody around him, again, kept a diary and later wrote, did an oral history, long drawn out discussions on what was going on on that campaign trail, which enabled me to bring all the stuff to life in extraordinary detail. And every one of the accounts, every single one, noted that Harry Truman truly believed he was going to win and nobody else, not even his wife, not even his daughter, oh. thought he had a shot. I wanna come back, oh, I wanna come back to the this Truman as underdog and, and the, uh, the fact that everybody was wrong about this. But I want to first just uh, mention again that we're talking to A.J. Bame about the uh, 1948 uh, presidential election. 
And thank you all for joining us on YouTube and Facebook. And please add your questions in or your comments in. We have a, a, our audience ranges from Hawaii to uh, England uh, and to France and all across the U.S. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. And we have a few comments that I thought were interesting. This isn't a question, but it did strike me. Uh, the 1948 election is as long ago from today as was the contested Hayes-Tilden election of 1876 from 1948. And I think that's a, a pretty wild thought to, uh, you know, it, it's, um, the, this election was in the lifetime of our, our parents, um, but uh, probably for most people today, it seems ancient, ancient history. Um, and then uh, we did have a question down here that I wanted to get to. Um, uh, uh, it was a question about the, if I can find it here. The question is, um, how did the Democratic Party move from Dixiecrat racism to becoming the party of the NAACP and civil rights and more? And part of that answer is right there in that 1948 convention, isn't it? It is. And it begins before that. It's it's absolutely because of one man, and that's Harry Truman. Um, I think it's extraordinary the fact that he came from Missouri, which was a segregated state and was a disputed state during the Civil War. Um, both of Truman's parents' families had sided with the South. And in so much as that when Truman became president, his mother came to visit him and refused to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom because she hated Abraham Lincoln because he represented the North and she thought of herself and the Truman family as the South. Um, so it's an extraordinary leap for this guy to come out and say, I'm gonna support, I'm essentially, not even essentially, without a doubt, launches the modern civil rights movement during this election cycle and even before. And the one question that people always ask is, why did Truman support civil rights? Did he do it because he realized for the first time for various reasons, uh, Smith versus Allwright, which is a very important Supreme Court decision in 1944, for various reasons, the African-American vote was gonna be more important than it ever had been. Um, so did he support civil rights and launch this movement because he thought it could win him the election or did he do it for moral reasons? And in my research, I really f feel like it, it was a very much a moral decision, which is fascinating because he would have been the last coming from where he came from, where the N word, you know, he grew up with the N word. That was, that's what was spoken in his home. So why did he do this? It was a moral decision. Did it win him the election? It sure helped. Yes. And there's a, um, there was a, I can't remember who it is, but one of the, uh, whether it was Thurmond or one of the people in his, uh, in his Dixiecrat movement who, they said, well, well, Truman's saying basically the same things that Roosevelt said. And they said, yes, but Truman means it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can't have that. It's a, that's a great quote. And um, it's, it's used often because it's so powerful. But, um, you know, there's another parallel that we can really draw to today. I, I don't know if you guys have a picture of Isaac, Wood, Isaac Woodard. Do you have that picture? No. There's this, okay, so this is extraordinary thing that happens after World War II. Um, uh, African Americans come back to the South, having served in the in the war, and they're expecting rights. They they they're like, listen, we served in this war, we fought for this country, we fought against racism in Nazi Germany. Uh, now we want we want to make that fight here at home, and uh, the response is this rash of of killings and lynchings of um, African Americans, even some who were you know who had just been discharged from the United States Armed Forces. And there's one in particular named Isaac Woodard, who comes back four hours after he's honorably discharged from the army, served in the war, still wearing his uniform. He's got in his pocket his discharge papers that have Harry Truman's signature on it. And he gets in an altercation with a white police officer and he gets beaten up and blinded with a nightstick. And his story becomes a cause celeb at the time. Uh, Orson Welles gets fired from his radio show for supporting Isaac Woodard. Um, the NAACP takes him on a speaking tour, and, and uh, the head of the NAACP, Walter White, goes into Truman's office, and he's like, look, these are the facts. Th there's no TV and no radio in these small communities in the South, rural communities, where Black people are getting killed with, with, with immunity, uh, no justice. And then there's Isaac Woodard's story, and this blows Truman's mind. 
and he says, he stands up and he says, we have to do something about this. And that sets this whole thing in motion because he can't believe that murders against so many people could occur in the United States and nobody seemed to care. One of the things, I mean, you know, along those lines, one of the things that has always kind of baffled me, a lot of my work has been about the Second World War. Um, and you, you, you look at kind of, basically what that war was fought for against against the Germans. You have all these Americans that are fighting in Europe. They endure all these things. Many of them see concentration camps, Strom Thurmond being one of them. Yeah. Thurmond writes home and says, this is the most terrible thing I've ever seen. And the bodies, I can't believe this. And then they come back to the South and they're like, yeah, this is okay. <laughs> and that, that is just a very jarring thing for me when I, when I try to process that. I agree. And I don't mean to laugh because I think it's funny. I laugh because it's shocking. Right. Um, it's something I'm writing about now for a new book and the amount of violence and the statistics um, and the idea that here in the United States of America, there could be ritualistic killings regularly staged. At times there would be larger crowds witnessing this stuff than what would appear at major league baseball games and nobody would be arrested and right. nobody would be charged. At the, 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 the coroner would write murder, quote, at the hands of unknown. Yeah. And so, you know, I think the president realized that this had to stop. Wow. And I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is that there's this is one of so many issues in this campaign because you also had uh, our, you know, the potential of a nuclear war. You had the uh, Berlin airlift. You had the recognition of Israel we haven't even talked about came up, which is another, the United States and Harry Truman recognized the new state of Israel in 1948. Again, some people, perhaps including George Marshall, thought it was for political reasons, um, but it's another, uh, you know, many people think it wasn't for political reasons, but then again, it was, it was because it was what he believed, but it's just another one of so many things pressing down. So we're in this election and uh, from very early on, there's one thing that everybody knows. They don't believe it. They know it. They know it for a fact. And that one thing is that Harry Truman is going to lose this election, that people are, are it's been 14 years or whatever of uh, 16 years of Republican, of a Democratic rule. Truman is not an impressive candidate. He's going to be out. And... Um, uh, I'm, I'm told, by the way, 1947 is when Israel was recognized. I see that comment coming up in the comments, so I'll, I'll correct there. But everybody knows he's going to lose. The pollsters know he's going to lose. The political handlers know he's going to lose. The pundits know he's going to lose. How did they get, all get it so, 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 so wrong? Well, I can answer that very easily. They misjudged Mr. Truman, President Truman. Uh, they didn't believe in him the way he believed in himself. But this is how he did it. He came up with a strategy. And the strategy was if he runs a campaign unlike any other, he's going to lose. He's got to break every rule in the book that can be broken without violating the law or really um, you know, destroying himself in the process. So what he decides to do is he decides to launch this campaign where he's going to get on a train and go all the places where nobody ever campaigned. Uh, all of these little towns, all of these places that where people had never in their lives believed that they would ever get to actually see a president of the United States. And because of the magic of the American presidency, people would turn up to see him and listen to what he had to say just because they were fascinated with the whole idea, the celebrity, the magic of the American presidency. So he does this. He goes and gives eight, nine speeches. And the, I, I really enjoyed writing about the mechanics of how it happened. So he's on this train. He sets up a secret research office in Washington, D.C., and then there are speechwriters in the White House. And so they would collect this material, put it on an airplane, fly it to wherever the Truman train was going to come in the next day. Truman would hit one of his operatives, would pick up this briefcase. So he's got some speeches for the major rallies. He'd have a speech written. But all in most of, most of it, he would have little note cards. He'd look at it, and then he would go out and speak to people off the cuff and just make it up. And he would know that in that little town, say there was a new sausage factory or there was a guy who a war hero who had just passed away. So he could just give enough inf information so that the people he was talking to, he could connect with them and they would understand that he cared about them. 
And then he would just be himself. And he believed that if he could just talk to people and be himself, that uh, people would vote for him. And it worked. And along the way, it was Robert Taft, Mr. Republican, who criticized him because another thing that Truman was saying everywhere he went is the 80th Congress is the worst Congress in history. The 80th Congress is the do nothing Congress. And Robert Taft, who was probably the most powerful man on Capitol Hill, conservative Republican, really didn't like this. And he accused Truman of blackguarding the uh, Congress in every whistle stop in America. Ooh. And that's what whistle stop comes from because people were offended to think of their towns as whistle stop. A whistle stop was a town where the train pulled in and it wasn't even worth your time to get off the train. They just blow the whistle and keep going. So all of these people who had pride in their hometowns, they thought this wasn't. In so Truman was able to capitalize on that. But that's where the term comes from. And this, the, the, the strategy, as we know, worked because along the way, he became more than a candidate. He became like an American folk hero. But does, does Truman, I guess, my Along those lines, my, my next kind of question is, is Truman carrying on that whole sort of New Deal populism or is he kind of trying to do something different? And when he's getting these people in these little small towns, is he tapping into something that they already feel? Or does he create that interest? Does he get them behind him? Does he change their minds or is it already there, do you think? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I kind of think both. And one thing that's important to realize is that, again, Truman and, and Dewey, they were on the same page in a lot of issues. Right. And so for a lot of people, when they stopped to think about it, it was really the choice was really about the fabric of the man rather than the policies, because, again, they kind of agreed. Um, and I think a lot of Americans were not sophisticated enough to really understand what it would mean from one to the other. But he won the election pretty much just through charisma. That's it. You, you know, I, I want to just touch on this again, because I've, I've always found this campaign fascinating. And um, you said they, they misjudged Truman. You know, the, the thing that has always struck me is that the great lesson of this campaign is beware the conventional wisdom. Because you have the uh, Gallup stops yeah. taking polls because he knows that... Um, Truman's going to lose, so why bother to keep polling? And the people who do keep polling, they show the race tightening, but they show uh, Dewey winning. And uh, 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 not too long before the election, Newsweek polls 50 uh, top-notch political reporter pundit, the, the, the chattering class, we would call it today, and 50 out of 50 say that um, that Truman's going to lose. So so as we're in an election year in uh 2020, it seems to me that a big lesson of 1948 is don't take the, the uh, assumed wisdom of the pundits and the polls too seriously. That much is absolutely the case. That we know. Now, you 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 hit on a, something I wanted to talk about a little bit, the Newsweek poll, because it's such a, a moving scene. Um, so I just want to talk about it for a little bit. So the train pulls into a certain station. I can't remember where it is, but um, there's the, the both campaigns are waiting for this big Newsweek story to come out. They pulled 50 people, powerful people in the know people, and the poll was going to come out and both sides knew it. So uh, the train, the Truman train pulls into a town and Clark Clifford, who was really the rising star of the Truman administration, young guy, never expected to be in politics, gets off the train sneaks out and buys this issue of Newsweek. He looks at it and he's devastated because 50 people were polled and 50 people said that Truman was gonna lose. So he's wearing an overcoat, he shoves it in there and he sneaks back on the train and Truman sees him and says, Clark, what do you got in your jacket there? And and uh, Clark's like, nothing. And he's like, I think you've got that issue of Newsweek magazine in there. And so Clark Clifford pulls it out and Truman is sitting with his daughter and he looks at it and he laughs. He's like, none of these people know what they're talking about. I'm going to win this election. That's not but, actually what he says. Do you care? Uh, what, 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 yeah. what, none, none of them can can pound sand worth a dam or something like that. Yeah. Uh, just, yes. So well, some or vivid Truman-esque expression. Exactly. Um, but to your point, I think the lesson is we have a situation today that's similar in that we have a candidate who increasingly the polls are saying he's way behind. And, you know, that was the same situation as it was years ago. And, um, you know, 
I think when when Truman won, he gave credit to big city labor. When Dewey lost, he thought I, the, the farmers abandoned me. That's what Truy, the Dewey thought. That's what did it. But in my opinion, so many people who would have voted for Dewey didn't show up at the polls because they thought he had it won and they didn't think their vote would make a difference. So whatever side you're on in 2020, your vote counts. It okay. matters. Show up. Yeah. So, so again, I mean, you just mentioned Dewey a little bit. How did, where did Dewey go wrong? I mean, so Truman clearly wins the election, but how did Dewey lose the election? Um, he starts out, <laughs> there he is. He's such a peculiar looking man. Um, he, um, he makes a decision early on in his campaign that he's going to run a highbrow sort of FDR-esque campaign. He's going to deliver beautiful poetic speeches and not really come down hard on any of the issues because he thought he's got this thing won. So the more commitments he makes, the more trouble it's going to be when he gets in the White House. So he comes, he sees us on this idea of this term unity. And so he has these speech writers write all of these beautiful stories about unity that really don't say anything. And um, his uh, members of his campaign are very upset. They're saying, you got to fight it out with this guy. He's coming after you. You got to fight. And Dewey says, look, I ran an attack campaign in 1940 for president and I lost. I ran an attack campaign for president in 1944 and I lost. I ran an, uh, a, a highbrow poetic campaign in 1942 for governor and I won. I did the same in 1946 for governor of New York, and I won by more votes than, it, than in the history of, the, of New York. And so he's like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to come down hard on any of the issues, and I'm not going to get in the boxing match and fight it out with this guy. I'm just going to go around the country and give these poetic speeches about unity. And, uh, and he lost. It was, it was, he could look back and say, ouch, that was a mistake. <laughs> But it's yeah. fascinating that even up to the end of the campaign, he was sure he was going to win. Yeah. And so much as he gets on a train for after his big uh, final event at Madison Square Garden, and he's going up to Albany, and he gives this impromptu meeting off the record with reporters. He's so sure he's going to win. He tells them all who's going to be in his cabinet. So that's how much you can imagine the devastation that he felt. Yeah, it had to hurt. The next day, you know, Dewey, I think, comes down to us. Maybe it's a little bit because of the way he looks. Um, uh, he, he he sort of seems like kind of a almost like a a, a slightly comic character. There was like a, a famous, decoration. pardon, like a cake decoration. Right, the famous exactly. comment that he looked like the little man on the wedding cake that no one ever quite wants to take credit for. Um, uh, but he, this guy was a let's just tell us a little bit about him because he actually was extremely accomplished and uh, there's every possibility he might have been a, a, a really excellent president if he'd gotten elected. Um, I wanted him to come off as a sympathetic character. Uh, I wanted readers to like him because I think he deserved to be liked. I think he was an extraordinary man, extraordinary public servant. Uh, he comes up as a prosecutor, and what he accomplishes, accomplishes is really incredible. He becomes at the youngest at the youngest age of any, it never happened before, um, assistant prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, and then head prosecutor. And he creates this division where he takes down what we would think of as the mafia today, and he becomes this extraordinary prosecutor hero. In so much as in two movies, he's actually played by Humphrey Bogart as this crime buster. And that's how he becomes famous. Um, uh, then he moves into politics at a very young age. He was so young when he first ran for president. Um, it was Harold Ickes, who was a new dealer, who said Dewey had thrown his diaper in the ring. <laughs> because he was so young. But he uh, even early on, you can see in the correspondence among powerful members of the Republican National Committee that they really thought early on that this young guy was their future. Uh, and I think, honestly, he would have made a really good president. So, Rick, can I go, or are you about to go? One of the questions I had, Chris, you know, we talk, talked about, please. you talked about, the importance of the election. Um, do the parties as we know them today evolve differently if the election of 1948 turns out differently? Mm. 
That's a fascinating question, and will take me a moment to to sort of, you know. Sorry about that. I didn't. Know. No, that, that, those are the do best questions play, for you. Do we need to play the Jeopardy theme for a little bit here? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Here's the obvious point to make. 1948 was the pivotal election where we really saw the Deep South, this extraordinarily powerful pocket of Democratic voters, begin to migrate over to the Republican Party. So that's the that's the most important sort of in your face theme from this election. South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, to a lesser deg degree Florida, North Carolina, Texas. All of these states that were part of the solid south based on one issue alone it was alluded to earlier the 19 the 1876 election, election. this was part of the solid south of, of the democratic party for one reason and that was race. So the, um, the federal government agreed to let the Southern Democrats control these states and they put white supremacy in place. And due to the civil rights movement, that's where all the migration in that area of the country, very important becomes, it starts to happen. And that's why all of those states pretty much voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and probably will again. We're seeing those states embattled politically again, I think, you know, in a way we haven't seen in a long, long time. As to your, uh, uh, to answer your question specifically, you know, it's really an interesting point because if, if Dewey had become president, he would have supported all these things that Truman did and he would have been embattled with his own Congress and what he would have actually gotten uh, accomplished is very hard to say. Um, so as to how much the Republican party would have morphed under his guidance, it's tricky to say, but I think he was such an effective leader he wasn't always a very well-liked man because he didn't care, but he was really good at accomplishing what he wanted to get accomplished. Well, if you if you if you want to take the contrafactual thing a little further, if um, you know, we'll walk you out uh, slowly on the limb as it gets thinner and thinner. <laughs> if Dewey gets elected president in 1948, does Dwight Eisenhower ever become president of the United States? Well, as we know now, and, and in retrospect, it was Dewey who um, really helped Eisenhower get elected in the first place. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite parts of Dewey Defeats Truman is um, how much the Democratic Party tried to get Ike to run in place of, of Truman because they were sure Truman couldn't win. And Eisenhower, being a military man, didn't belong to either party. So if I've, Eisenhower was going to go into politics, everybody was wondering, which side is he going to be on? And he refuses to say, he won't answer the question. He won't run for president in 1948. But right after the convention, he shows conventions. He shows up at Dewey's farmhouse for a photo op. And you have this moment where they're clearly staging this thing where Eisenhower is revealing that, yep, I'm a Republican. And um, these two men sitting together, they're close to the face enough so that uh, close enough so the photographers can get their faces into a frame. And they both believed that one of them was going to be the next, the first Republican president in 16 years. They were just mistaken about which one it was going to be. Now, to answer your question, I think Dewey would end up a, a good, solid, two-term Republican president, and the whole Ike era never would have happened. Yeah, and that's a that's a crazy uh, left turn for for history if that happens, or right turn, whatever. Uh, uh, that's that's wild. How was how question came up? How how you mentioned Dewey as a prosecutor, but he was a good governor too, wasn't he? Pretty good governor of New York. Excellent governor. Um, he was he was so well loved that he won in forty six by a larger majority. I'd already mentioned than any governor had ever won before. And today, you know, it's interesting. I think he was such a successful governor. It's it, it pains me a little bit to think about his legacy because most people only know him for the the headline yeah. Dewey defeats Truman that's what they know of Thomas Dewey or they drive down the Thomas Dewey Expressway I think it's highway 87 that goes right through uh New York State um but he was an extraordinarily successful governor yeah so um AJ what happens you know I've always been very interested in in the New Deal um Roosevelt administration did a lot of research on the CCC, so it's kind of where my frame of reference is coming from. But you mentioned in the book that Truman has what he what people are calling the New Deal, I guess, as opposed to what Roosevelt had, or the Fair Deal, excuse me. Yeah. 
what happens to the fair deal? Does it become a real thing? Does it get lost in the wash? Um, people to still some degree, it, gets, it gets lost in the wash yeah. to some degree. Um, and when, when Truman leaves office in 1950, January 1953, actually, he's thought of as a, this extraordinarily ineffective president because a lot of the things he had fighted for, he fought for universal health care, universal military training, a lot of this stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. And so when he leaves office, Americans think of him as this guy who just kind of, kind of like Jimmy Carter, like he was a really good guy and everybody, nobody hated him, but he didn't get enough done, you know? And to me, the fascinating, one of the many fascinating parts of the Truman legacy is that the whole idea of we think of him so highly now and right. why is that, you know, when he left office, uh, he had terrible approval, approval ratings because not enough of it got accomplished. A lot of what he wanted to do was too far to the left for Americans to swallow after so many years of Roosevelt. I mean, in, in, and uh, so taking that thought a little bit further, uh, uh, these days, I, I would say, you know, everybody uh, wants to be Harry Truman. Every candidate uh, wants to claim Harry Truman, claim the mantle of Harry Truman, whether it's Donald Trump or Barack Obama or other candidates, they've got a quote of Truman, they've got something that says that they're like Truman. And, and, and how can that be? I mean, how can everybody want to be Truman? How can everybody claim to be Truman? Um, you know what? If, if there's one, okay, this is the part where I'm like, hey, I'm trying to sell books here. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one question this book answers, it's that. And, and the reason why, I mean, think about it. Why when he leaves office does he have miserable approval ratings? And now he's either six or seven, always right about there, right about where Eisenhower is usually on best presidents of all time. Uh, Judge Roy Moore. Everybody knows who Judge Roy Moore is. Judge Roy Moore on the on the campaign trail, quoting Truman, Donald Trump, when he appears before the UN General Assembly for the first time, he gives a speech. The world is watching because everybody's fascinating, fascinated, like, who is this guy? He quotes Truman. Nancy Pelosi quotes Truman. So you're right. And why is that? And I think that the, his story of the 1948 election really answers that question because he comes to be this figure who symbolizes courage, um, power in the face of, uh, of um, obstacles that it's seemingly insurmountable. He was a, one of my favorite things about this guy, um, and again, I don't want this to be head, head geography in just in terms of like me talking about what a great guy this guy, but he listened. There's a reason why we all respect him. And one of my favorite things about having spent all this time with him is to explore his relationship as a father and a husband. And um, candidates are always talking about family values. This dude lived it. He really did. He was a good father and a good husband. Uh, he was a great hero of Black America. All of these things that he did that at the time, and you know, one other reason is, in obviously, as we know from 1948, people really didn't realize how good they had it. And into the into his, sec, his second term, there was so much going on that it, only in retrospect could people understand how good of a time that was for America, certainly economically. And finally. A lot of the decisions that he made, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, those were such controversial programs. It took 50 years for us to realize how smart they were. And he himself said, listen, even George Marshall said, I don't know if this is going to work, this Marshall Plan thing. It's, it might work, but if we don't try something, we're going to lose. So they tried things that had never been done. It turns out they did well. So AJ, hold up that book again for everybody here. We're gonna just put you on because I, I read the ebook, so I can't really hold that up. But it's Dewey defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the battle for America's soul. It's a terrific book. It's not a hagiography, hey and I know some people accuse David McCullough of that when he wrote about Truman. Although I really like that book, but it is a an excellent book, and uh, you have been an excellent guest. And thank you for joining us on your birthday weekend and whatever uh, toll the gin and tonics took last night, it doesn't seem to have impaired you the least today. Well, I thank you so much uh, for having me and among other things, allowing me to have a happy hour at one o'clock on a Sunday. <laughs> it's work related. It's, <laughs> a man does what he has to do. AJ, Bing, thank you so much. Thanks, thank AJ. you both, I really appreciate it. Thank you, take care of yourself. And you.
That was awesome. Yes. That was terrific. Uh, we have to keep saying nice things about him because he can still hear us, you know. Well, no, but it was yeah. true. No, it was good. It was good. So um, uh, I have a, a little uh, history all around us that connects to Harry Truman and uh, and, and political history. Um, uh, and uh, it involves a hotel that's just down the street from uh, where we live here on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And that would be the Blackstone Hotel. Uh, which is a great old hotel. Uh, and Harry Truman stays here at the Blackstone Hotel during the 1944 convention. You can read about it in AJ's book. Uh, and it's here that he gets word that uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt wants him on the ticket as vice president and is not going to be happy if Harry Truman doesn't agree to do it. And so it's here also in his suite at the Blackstone that he's got to, uh, to tell Bess about this and apparently kind of negotiate <laughs> negotiate the deal with Bess because maybe she's not too thrilled about it. Thrilled about it, yeah. Now, but the other thing that's neat about the Blackstone here is it's got another piece of political history that goes back to the Republican convention in 1920 in Chicago. And in 1920, right. they were deadlocked after four of ballots, I think, between two candidates we don't even remember at this moment. And the, all the power brokers, uh, the Republican Party power brokers gather in room 915, nice suite on an upper floor, and they decide to kind of reach down to the fourth place candidate, a virtual unknown named Warren G. Harding, senator from Ohio, and they pick him as the candidate that they are going to, uh, to have uh, run for president. And as dawn breaks, a reporter for the Associated Press named Kirk Simpson files a story saying Harding of Ohio was chosen by a group of men in a smoke-filled room earlier today. And Harding, of course, goes on to become president and the smoke-filled room, uh, which was that room at the Blackstone, a important part of our political lexicon. And a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, before we lived in Chicago, when we were just visiting, Marilyn and I uh, bribed, tipped, whatever the <laughs> word is, the yeah. concierge at the Blackstone. And we got to go up and he took us on a little tour of Suite 915, the smoke-filled room. And it's filled with all sorts of smoking paraphernalia of various wow. kinds, in every nook and cranny. Of course, it's a no-smoking room. So, <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> none of that is of any use at all whatsoever. But a little history around us that relates to this story. And Chris, I, I, we didn't actually talk about this in our pre-production, but it, it, do you have a joke for us this week? No, or? I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I decided um, that politics is too serious. Really. I think we're going to, I think a viewership is just going to decline markedly. If, you know, I can hear the claps and cheers if they don't have to have a joke. This yeah, week. That might increase markedly. Yeah. And Chris, what do we have going on next week? Well, so next week we, you know, um, we were talking about future shows, and we realized that uh, the show is called History Happy Hour, but we've yet to um, have a show dedicated to alcohol. Uh, so uh, we're going to have um, somebody I know quite well, uh, my wife Anna, who was for quite some time an archaeologist at uh, Mount Vernon, and while she was there, she discovered some very interesting things about uh, Mr. Washington. Uh, and how he made a good deal of money. So we're going to be talking about uh, George Washington's whiskey distillery and what yes, she. Either founding father or bootlegger, George founding Washington. Founding father or bootlegger. That's exactly right. Not really a bootlegger because it was legal, but what the heck? We might as well. It had a ring to it. It had a, <laughs> had a nice ring to it. So thank you everybody for joining us this week. Please come by and uh, uh, check us out next week, and uh, check out our web page uh, on the Stephen Ambrose. Uh, historical tours website and chris another great hour thank you so much thank you so much take care everyone be safe